Okay, thanks. Okay, I guess it's time to start. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the challenging domain session. And I'm E. Lee from Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Uh, so I'll be the session chair of this session. So no matter where you are, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, so in this session, we have a lineup of uh, three great talks on the testing of uh, embedded systems, uh, mobile robots, and Spark applications. So I can't wait uh, to find out more about these topics. And the first presentation will be given by Per Eric Stratberg. Uh, the title of the presentation will be uh, Intermittent Blade Filling Test in the Embedded System Domain. So Eric, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Let's see if this works. If I press chair and you, we have both slides and audio, right? Yes. Good. Okay. Hi, I'm Per. Uh, Flaky test is a hot topic here at ISTA. Here's our uh, paper on a similar topic. So I'm Per. This is intermittently failing tests in the embedded systems domain. So as you can see from the list of authors and affiliations, this is industry academia collaboration. So let's first talk about the industry context and the research goals. So I'm from Westmo and we develop embedded systems. Embedded systems have both software and hardware. Uh, the hardware in our embedded systems target uh, industry sites such as this one, where every node in the, this solar array must be able to communicate with each other node. So if one of the nodes would go down or a link would be lost, traffic would be redirected so that there is always communication going on. And this is achieved not only with copper in the ground, but with communication protocols. And these communication protocols are part of the software being developed here. Embedded systems also have hardware and the hardware in our products are switches and routers uh, for harsh domains. They are made in metal. So for example, uh, some customers use them on board trains where there are vibrations or dirty power spikes or extreme temperatures. So every day we develop the software in these systems and every night we test them in nightly testing. And testing is done in test systems such as this one. So a typical test system would have uh, these nodes uh, being the switches and routers, uh, cables, IOs for powering things on and off. There's also a test server uh, outside of the picture. Um, and we have many of these test systems. Um, and I can also mention that uh, a typical test case could be to verify that the firewall functionality works as expected. And in order to, te to test uh, the firewall functionality, you might need three nodes, one, two, three here. The first one could send the traffic in the network. The second one could act as the firewall trying to block some of the traffic. And the third one would capture this traffic that slips through and verify that the correct traffic uh, passed through it. And in a series of reconfiguration, the steps, the resending and reanalyzing uh, the data, uh, we would verify that the firewall works as expected. Um, this test case might require several minutes and it's one test script. And we run these test scripts on dozens of test systems, giving us thousands of combinations of um, uh, possible combinations and also thousands of verdicts to look at each morning. And sometimes, now we get to the problem, sometimes we see intermittently failing tests. So these are test cases that over time, overnight, when we execute them, they pass and fail sort of randomly uh, in a fashion that we don't really understand. So even though each test case would start the system in the same state, it would give the same input, we still observe different output. But this is a tough problem. These test cases are hard to debug, they can lead to distrust in testing and we waste resources. So we want to explore and explain the root causes for these intermittently failing tests in our domain. What are the root causes? And are these root causes different when compared to consistently failing tests? So that's the context and research goal. Now let's talk a little bit about terminology. So as I said, embedded systems have both hardware and software. 
Uh, but in this paper, we also talk about the testware. And testware could be physical things like the servers and cables and load generators. And at Westmo, this weighs more than a ton, this equipment. It fills up a big room. But testware also includes software like the operating systems and servers and the various libraries and so on. Uh, included in the software part of the testware is also the test framework with the test cases implemented in scripts. So I want to emphasize that the test cases are code and they are part of the testware here. Let's talk about unit level testing. So uh, in unit level testing, when you are targeting 10, 15, maybe 50 lines of code at a time, testing is inexpensive. And there is a lot of previous work done on flaky tests. Uh, and down here, uh, one definition of a flaky test could be that you execute the same test case at least twice. Uh, you use the same software, and you use the same hardware or no hardware, and you use the same testware, but still you observe different verdicts. Um, now there are alternative definitions here. John Bell, for example, in one paper, they look at code changes and code coverage to do something slightly different, which is also interesting. But in this presentation, we stick to this definition. Now, if we take these 10, 15, 50 lines of code uh, and put it in the file they came in, we take this file in the libraries they are part of, and we put these libraries in an operating system, which is Linux in our case, and we take the operating system and we put it in the hardware to get an embedded system, and we take this embedded system to put it in a test system, and we have a fleet of these test systems in the test environment. Now we are not at unit level testing anymore, we are doing system level testing. And here, access to these test systems uh, can be limited. So that's one of the challenges here. Uh, there's just not enough of these test systems. Another challenge is time. We don't have time to run all the test cases. So in the data we collected for this case study, we ran, we saw that we ran roughly a third of the test cases each night. And there are also frequent changes in the software under test and also the testware and sometimes also the hardware here. So if we look at the number of consecutive nights with the same software and testware code, we see that the average is 2.3, but the median is one. So the typical scenario is that when we come to work in the morning, something has changed uh, when compared to yesterday. So there might be flaky tests here, but we cannot observe them in the true definition of a flaky test because things change all the time. So for this reason, we define intermittently failing tests as test cases that when they are executed repeatedly with the potential evolution in software, hardware and testware, the verdict changes over time. Now, you might object to this definition. You might say, but Pad, are you really surprised that verdicts change if you change things? And you might also say, but are you actually really running the same test cases if you change the test code? Uh, these are, of course, good objections. Uh, and to answer that, no. Uh, first of all, we are not always surprised that verdicts change. Um, but typically, when we do changes, they are minor and incremental, and we should cover the same functionality and requirements with the test cases uh, over time. Otherwise, we consider them different test cases. One of the contributions of this paper is a model for intermittently failing tests that we call Q-score. Let's talk about that now. So um, in order to measure intermittence, we uh, think of test cases as Markov chains. So they have three states, pass, fail, and invalid. Invalid here would mean that the test case could not run to completion. So there was an unhandled exception or we lost communication with some peripheral hardware or something. So over time, when we are executing the test case, we can think of it as jumping between these states in the Markov chain or staying in the same state over time. Now, in general, the Markov chain has um, some transition probabilities. These are unknown to us. And instead, we focus on the observed verdicts. Uh, so here we are looking at the window of eight verdicts, and here we now count the number of transitions. So eight verdicts give us seven transitions uh, in the transition matrix N. So we start with a one here because once there was a transition from pause to pause, which is here, and then there was a two because there are two transitions from pause to fail, and so on and so forth. And we now use these uh, transitions to calculate how often the verdict changed, which is the sort of non-diagonal elements here. And now we can use Q-score to look at two examples. And these are real examples from the data we collected in this case study. So first we have a consistently failing test. So over time, it went pause, pause, pause. 
then it changed opinion, it goes invalid over time, and then it goes back to pausing. Now we plot Q score with a window size of 13 as the dashed curve over here, over here. And we can see a small bump corresponding to this change in state here, and another small bump here corresponding to this change in state. We can see that Q score is always very low, so the intermittence is very low for this test case. And we can see the pass ratio as the dotted curve over here. It starts at one because the test case is always passing at the beginning. It goes down to zero because there are no passing verdicts uh, in this interval. And then it goes up to one again when the test case has been fixed. That was a consistently failing test. Now let's look at an intermittent test case. So it starts out mostly passing, and then it very frequently changes opinion here. So over time, it changes opinion almost every day, uh, it feels like. And then someone fixed it, and it ends up uh, mostly passing here, or only passing here. And again, if we look at the dashed curve, the Q score, we can see that it fluctuates a bit. It, it's actually very high here. It almost reaches one, where the test case very frequently changes opinion. And then when the test case was fixed, it goes down to, to zero it's not intermittently failing anymore. And p-score goes up and down a bit and uh, it never actually reaches zero because there are always some passing verdicts in each position of this window and then it goes up to one again when it was fixed. Now we can use p-score and q-score and different window sizes and different thresholds of p-score and q-score to define two groups of test cases. First, these intermittently failing tests that have been fixed and we call these uh, test cases in group A. A6 for a window of six and a larger window of 13 verdicts. And similarly, the consistently failing tests uh, that have been fixed. So that's how we measure and look at intermittence in this uh, paper. Now let's look at the case study, how we collect the data and some of the results. So we we collect data from nine months of nightly testing. So these are actually 270 nights of test testing, more than half a million verdicts. And there are more than 5,000 combinations of test scripts and test systems here, giving us more than 5,000 test cases. And of these, 230 are more interesting, meaning that they fit into one of these groups that we just defined, the intermittently failing or the consistently failing ones. And there's actually a small overlap here because, because of the window size. Um, now we have these 230 test cases and we want to know what fixed them uh, so that we can understand the root cause for intermittently failing tests. And in order to understand what fixed these test cases, we dig in the archives. So we first look at um, the test results database and uh, look at visualizations of test results to figure out when, where and how the test case failed. Uh, we look at changes in the testware code and in the software code. We look at test, ex test execution logs, uh, the device communication logs when the uh, test framework communicated with the devices during the testing. We look at project logs, um, issue trackers, and we discussed with colleagues and uh, looked at old meeting notes. And using these data sources, we now have a number of factors that could lead to intermittently failing tests at uh, at Westmo, and this answers research question one. And I'm going to give you some highlights here. The details are in the paper. So for example, we could see that we sometimes had test system issues, meaning that we would have to reboot or reconfigure a server or fiddle with USB sticks. And we also sometimes identified faults in the software and the hardware. For example, when we had incorrect assumptions on timing in the software. We could also see that some uh, intermittently failing tests had more than one root cause. And this sort of supports the idea that one, um, uh, one bug could sort of hide another bug uh, because we are one test case has more than one problem. Now, if we compare the intermittently failing test with the consistently failing test, we can see that indeed there are differences. And for example, when we um, fix consistently failing tests, we see that these have more of what we call duplicates, meaning that one fix for one uh, consistently failing tests also takes care of many other test cases. We also see that when we are trying to diagnose the intermittently failing tests, this is harder. We had to dig deeper and into more of these archives uh, to figure out the root cause. So uh, there you have it. That actually answers research question one and two. 
But now let's take a step back. Let's read a little of the related work and try to see if we cannot build on the shoulders of giants. Um, so if we start uh, discussing unit level testing down here in the left of the figure, we can see that there is a large body of research uh, that has been done on flaky tests for unit level testing of open source projects in particular. But as we move to the right in this picture, we uh, could only identify four previous studies that are on a system level. And these are papers by Amar et al, Ek et al, Lam et al, and Torv et al. And, and now today at ISTA here, we have had another paper by Lam et al on, on a similar topic, which is very interesting. So, but there seems to be a shortage of research here up on a system level. Um, however, there has been a long history of research on intermittent faults, even since before software. So we found a paper from the 40s. So apparently there were PDFs back then uh, by, I'm, I'm just kidding, of course, uh, a paper by Cooper in the 40s uh, when he looked at um, problems with electrical systems. So he could find intermittent faults in protective circuits, for example. Uh, Ball and Hardy in the 60s, they looked at intermittent faults in the aerospace domain and so on and so forth. So it's, it is, of course, very rewarding to read these uh, related papers and if we try to sort of summarize that knowledge and build on top of that, we now have nine factors for uh, intermittently failing tests. Uh, again, the details are in the paper. I'm going to give you some highlights. Uh, for example, I can mention that test case assumptions, this is um, a factor that is mentioned a whole lot in previous work. And it's also something we found in our case study. Uh, factor five, which is on resource leaks, uh, this is found in previous work. It is not found in the case study we did. But we know anecdotally that we have, um, have seen resource leaks and that these could lead to intermittently failing tests. And we actually have an example, um, sort of a motivating example in the beginning of the paper on this. Um, you can read the details in the paper. Um, so, so that's a factor that is only seen in previous work and not in our case study. And factor nine on the code maintenance, that if you do maintenance and sort of refactoring of your code, that could lead to intermittently failing tests. This is a factor that is not seen as far as we can tell in previous work, but it's seen in our case study. So there you have it. Uh, now to summarize, I'm Per Erik Strandberg. This has been a presentation on intermittently failing tests in the embedded systems domain. Uh, our paper has four main contributions. First, we have these nine factors for intermittently failing tests in this domain. Second, we have Q-score, which is a novel metric for measuring intermittence over time. Uh, third, uh, when we identify root causes for intermittently failing tests, we find this is harder when compared to consistently failing tests. And fourth, uh, when we fix a consistently failing test, this often repairs more than one test case at a time. The paper will be made, avail made available as open access, but you can also find it in the archive. And with that said, I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, yes, I will read out some questions uh, from Slack. So the first question, hmm? uh, how would you recommend developers to determine the window size to observe uh, intermittent faults when calculating Q scores? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Um, when we uh, decided on using, um, when we experimented with window size, we, we saw that there were pros and cons of different sizes. So we went for a small one of six and the large one of 13. Um, I think you would have to experiment um, with this, I don't think that 13 is, is a magic number. You would have to experiment. And what we are actually doing now um, in, in future work is sort of um, looking at um, a test results visualization portal. And as a part of that, we want to show the flaky tests. And there we are just picking, you know, whatever is tested in the last 30 or 40 or whatever days and use that as the input. So we are actually looking at calendar days instead of number of executions. Um, so that's a very bad answer, but <laughs> you have to experiment, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the previous question was from uh, Wayne Land, and uh, the next one is also from him. So for the difficult to fix cases, what diagnosing methods or tools did developers find helpful? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, 
so this is actually two uh, two questions. Uh, so uh, one question is the tools we used, and um, I I would have to read the paper to get them in number. But we had like twelve different tools, uh, and uh, and that was me doing the analysis. Uh, but when uh, when they were fixed, you know, these were historic data, so they had been fixed in the past. Um, I would have to uh, I would have to do some research to to understand that uh, to, to figure that out. It's a very good question, and I don't have a clear answer. Um, but intuitively, I would say uh, test results visualization. So we our test systems are slightly different. You know, test system A is slightly different when compared to test system B. So when we show results from one test system, we show the results from another test system just next to it so that you can sort of rapidly hypothesize, aha, it has to do with the hardware because it's only present in one of the test systems. Um, but if it's present on more than one test system, then maybe it's a problem in the test case. So I think um, visualizing the test results and also looking at the log files uh, can help. And I know a lot of previous work has, has used the log files in many different interesting ways. Uh, people have done clustering on the log files and um, all sorts of crazy things. So I think log okay. files and visualizing the results are, are two keys here. Okay, that was clear. Yeah, thank you again, Per. Uh, so let's move on to the next talk. So the next talk is uh, feasible and stressful trajectory generation for mobile robots. And the talk will be given by Carl uh, Hedebrand from University of Virginia. And I also want to mention that uh, the authors of this paper has uh, made their artifacts available and the artifacts actually won the uh, distinguished artifact award yeah the stage is yours Carl. thank you so much um can you see everything correctly yes perfect well thank you for introducing me my uh, name is carl and today i'll be giving the presentation on our paper feasible and stressful trajectory generation for mobile robots as mobile robots become more pervasive in society so does our awareness of the potential impact faults in these systems could have in society not only in autonomous systems that we see every day, but in a wide range of vehicles, from autonomous car crashes to factory robots, airplanes, and autonomous drones. And this list uh, could easily continue. As the impact of these faults become more apparent, testing of these systems becomes more important. One way to test these systems is using end-to-end -end system testing, in which the system is given a goal, generally some trajectory, and the trajectory is then executed in a simulator or in the real world. The big question becomes how to generate these goal trajectories. Imagine you're a tester given this empty parking lot and you needed to test your vehicle. If you were testing an autonomous car, you could select two random points and generate a typical trajectory between these two points. Similarly, if you're testing an autonomous drone, you could take the same approach taking into account the additional spatial dimension. The major problem you would be faced with is that even when only considering traversing between two points in space, there are infinitely many ways to traverse between these two points. For example, you might follow a straight trajectory between the points, or you might take the curved trajectory between the points. So the first question you, you might ask yourself is which trajectories do you want to use as a system test? While trying to solve this first problem, you'll realize that many of the trajectories between these two points are infeasible. They cannot, they cannot be physically achieved by your specific vehicle. Thus, for each test, you need to consider your vehicle's physical abilities carefully. Now, one might argue that there are sets of typical trajectories or standard trajectories you expect your robot to do in the real world, and thus you want to test those. For example, just going down a straight corridor. And we agree that exploring these typical trajectories is necessary to validate the behavior of the mobile robot. However, we argue they may overlook faults that only arise in the presence of stressful trajectories. This thought being analogous to stress testing or load testing software systems. For example, consider the, this uh, drone flying down a corridor. Here we're looking at the drone from both behind and a bird's eye view to get a set, just to get a sense of the environment. We can see that the goal is to fly down this straight corridor and the drone might pass this, uh, this test with flying colors. These standard use cases are necessary to validate the robot. However, with the same drone placed in a corridor with a series of sharp unexpected turns, you might find faults that only arise under these stressful conditions. Before we talk about what we did, let us let us formalize the problem. So given a physical space W, and note in this figure, we only use two dimensions, 
the physical space could be three dimensions as done in our paper and given a set of waypoints, WY inside the space, um, we have a robot R that is capable of traversing between a subset of waypoint pairs in a given time step. This subset of waypoint pairs is said to be valid. A robot arriving at a given waypoint I will enter with state SI, and we want to find a trajectory traj, which is just a set of robot states that are physically feasible and thus only comprise of valid steps. Remember that there's a huge number of possible trajectories and many of these trajectories are infeasible and thus cannot be realized by the implemented system. We also define a function called score that defines the stress placed on a robot for a given pair of waypoints. The stress could be a maximum deviation from the intended trajectory as shown by the blue line or any other measurable metric such as maximum acceleration or total time. According to our score function, we want our final trajectory to also be stressful such that for each of the feasible trajectories, our stressful trajectory induces more stress on the robot R. So the goal is feasible yet stressful trajectories. In this talk, I'll go over a, couple, uh, over a conceptual solution that describes the core technical contributions of our approach. The algorithmic solution is presented in more details in our paper. There are three main stages to our approach. The first is a technique that allows us to find trajectories. The next stage is a technique that allows us to filter out any physically infeasible trajectories. And finally, a technique to select the most stressful trajectories. So to start, let's see how we can go about generating large sets of trajectories between two points. First, we populate the physical space with random waypoints. Two of the waypoints are defined as a start and end positions. These are positions where the robot will start and end during the test. Next, we connect each of the waypoints with edges to form a graph. And finally, we just turn this into a graph search problem to find all paths through the graph that will start at the starting waypoint and eventually end at the end waypoint. So now we know how to solve finding trajectories by turning the problem into a graph and searching through the graph using a graph search algorithm. The idea is a modification to a robotic planning algorithm called the probabilistic roadmap planner or PRM. So next we need to find a way to identify the physically feasible trajectories. This is a tricky question. We need to be able to identify whether a robot can physically achieve a trajectory before we execute that set trajectory. The key to solving this problem or the secret source was the realization that by incorporating the physical model into the generation process, we could compute how we expect the robot to behave. So let me expand on this. First, we need to know what robot we're working with. In our paper, we use a quadrotor as shown in the figure, although the following approach applies to any robot. A quadrotor state can be described using a 12th order system, which describes the position in the world, the attitude, which is the roll pitch and yaw, the velocity and the angular velocity. We know that, the, well, that a quadrotor is controlled by varying the prope propeller's velocity, which allows it to create the forces which ultimately move it. The relationship between the inputs, which in this case are the propeller's velocities and the final position have been mathematically modeled. The mathematical models which describe how these changes occur are called kinematic and dynamic models. Specifically, the kinematic model describes the motion of an object in space, while the dynamic model describes the forces associated with the motion of an object. On the left, we show an example of this model whose input is the rotation of the propellers and the output U1 to U4 represents the different forces on the uh, body of the quadrotor. Using these forces, we can update the angular velocity, which in turn can be used to update the attitude, which finally updates the velocity and subsequently the position. These kinematic and dynamic models are not uncommon and are used in many fields, including robotics, astrophysics, mechanical engineering, biomechanics, and game physics. So they, they, they are widely available for a wide range of robots. In summary, using these kinematic and dynamic models allows us to compute the future position of a robot given some input, which in this case is the propeller velocity. If we were to sample all permutations of the propeller velocity and apply them to our kinematic and dynamic models, we could compute all future positions of the, of the robot. The area or volume covered by all future states is called the reachable set. And this is the area or volume of the robot that the robot is physically able to achieve. For example, here is a computed reachable set of a quadrotor you can see that after one second, if all motors were turned off, it would fall directly down roughly 10 meters. And also depending on the combination of propeller speeds, you can see that you would end up somewhere inside this red dome above the quadrotor. If a waypoint was to fall outside the reachable set, we know that it would be physically infeasible for the quadrotor to achieve that waypoint in the given time frame. So we know that using the robot's reachable set, we can remove all infeasible trajectories by only selecting trajectories that lie inside the, reach, uh, the robot's reachable set. And so now the final piece of the puzzle is how do we find stressful trajectories? 
So consider the following trajectory. The black line shows the intended trajectory and the red dotted line shows the actual trajectory of the robot after execution. So how could we compute the stress on the robot before the robot was to traverse it? Well, to start, let us consider a subset of the trajectory. If we can compute the stress on a smaller subset of the trajectory, we could apply the same technique to the entire trajectory by just stepping through each pair of waypoints. We can measure the stress, which, again, um, which we again demonstrate as the maximum deviation. We know that the expected velocity uh, into the first waypoint, v in, we know the expected velocity out of the trajectory called v out, and we know the angle between these two trajectories, theta. Thus, all we need is a function f, which in our problem statement we called the score function, that takes in these measures and predicts the maximum deviation. In our paper, we proposed two ways of computing the score function. First, this function could be handcrafted by experts. For example, if an expert knows that for a specific robot, high velocities are likely to increase the stress, the function would predict that trajectories that have a large V in and V out are likely to lead to a large deviation. A second approach is that you can learn this function using machine learning techniques, if no, if no information about the robot is known prior to testing. So how would you go about learning these functions? We start by gener generating random feasible trajectories. We then execute these trajectories and record the resulting stress measures and different features. So for example, here you can see that we recorded both uh, theta and maximum deviation. Uh, we also see that as theta increases, so does maximum deviation. We then use machine learning to learn a function that fits the data. In our paper, we use a polynomial regression model where the loss function is the linear least squares function and regularization is given by the L2 norm. Using this new function, uh, more stressful trajectories can be generated. The benefit to this approach is that at no stage do we need input from an expert. You however might be worried that they will not perform as well as a scoring function created by an expert. We compare the, we compare the learned scoring functions to the handcrafted scoring functions later in our study. So now we know all the building blocks required for our algorithm to generate both feasible and stressful trajectories. Again, what I described is just a conceptual overview of our design. The paper contains many more algorithmic details and a fully worked example. We have made our implementation of our tool available with more details on our website. Here we show two examples which are modified simulations to include walls to emphasize how stressful trajectories could lead to collision. On the left, we see an example of a drone moving down a fairly straight corridor. And on the right, we see a drone making a very sharp turn, which induces uh, stress and then leads to a collision with the wall on the right. We evaluated our approach and aimed at answering two main research questions. First, does the introduction of the kinematic and dynamic model improve the ability to generate feasible and valid trajectories? And second, does the introduction of a scoring model improve the ability to generate stressful trajectories? We performed our evaluation in a physical world, which was set to a 30 meter wide cube with a volume of 27,000 meters cubed and placed 250 waypoints inside this world. We ran our study on two quadrants. The first is called the Flight Goggles Quadrator, which is a quadrator simulation made available by MIT based on the drone in the left image. And for this quadrator, we implemented four different software controllers to see if a different control methods affected our technique. Secondly, we used a Parrot and Affy Quadrator, which has both a physical and a simulation uh, available. So to answer the first research question, we ran our experiment to see how many physically valid trajectories were generated in the set time as we varied the length of the trajectory. We generated trajectories using three different techniques. The first technique used no kinematic and dynamic model, and the results are shown in the blue line with the, with the circle markers. The second technique used an approximated kinematic and dynamic model that approximates the reachable set using the quadrotor's maximum velocity. And the final technique used the more expensive and accurate full kinematic model. We found that for short trajectories of length three, it was better to randomly search the graph or search the graph using the approximate kinematic and dynamic model. However, using the full kinematic model started to outperform both techniques after about trajectories of length five. And in fact, by length eight, both no kinematic and approximate kinematic techniques were unable to generate physically valid trajectories in the given amount of time. We continued our experiments up to uh, trajectories of length 50 and found that our technique was still able to find a single physical uh, valid trajectory in this given time. Thus, our takeaway was that using the kinematic and dynamic model improves the ability to find these physically feasible trajectories. To answer the second research question, we wanted to find out if introducing a scoring model would improve the ability to generate stressful trajectories. To do this, we focused on four different scoring models. The first assigned high scores to trajectories with high velocities. The next two assigned high scores to high velocities um, and to trajectories with turns of different degrees. 
And the final scoring model was learned based on the initial set of uh, tests we ran using no scoring model. So to answer RQ2, we generated a test set using no scoring model and then used that as a baseline. We then generated four new test sets using four different scoring models as shown on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we show the maximum deviation of the scoring model divided by the mean maximum deviation with no scoring model. Thus, any value greater than one represents an increase in the stress compared to the set of trajectories with no scoring model, while any value less than one represents a decrease in stress compared to the set of trajectories with no scoring model. We can see that for both the high velocity and learned scoring models, all trajectories generated at a higher stress than the, the mean maximum deviation when no scoring model was used. This, however, only shows the results for a single control method of the flight goggles quadrotum. When we look at the results for each of the different software configurations, we found that at least one of three handcrafted scoring models resulted in a more stressful test set. More specifically, for both waypoint controllers, including a scoring model that favors trajectories of high velocity, results in tests that are 70% and 76% more stressful. For a fixed velocity controller, a scoring model that favors 180 degree turns resulted in a test that is 9% more stressful, with some of the outliers being 40% more stressful. And for the minimum snap controller, a scoring model that favored, nine, a scoring model that favored 90 degree turns induces on average 69% more stressful tests. We also show that it is possible to learn scoring models that can generate stressful trajectories for a specific quadrotor that are almost as good as the scoring models that were created by experts. So our takeaway from these results was that in, in, in introducing both the handcrafted and learned scoring models into trajectory generation produces tests that are on average of 55.9% and 41.3% more stressful than trajectories without a scoring model. Next, we performed a study using a commercially available quadrotor. To do our study, we ran our experiments on the ANAFI drone in both the official simulator Sphinx, which is a modified version of Gazebo, and ran the tests in the real world in an empty field. For these tests, we learned scoring functions and showed that in both simulation and the real world, our tests on average produce tests that are more stressful than um, the test generated just using no scoring function. From a testing point of view, we know that one might be interested in trajectories that violate certain specifications. So for example, a tester might specify that the maximum deviation from the expected trajectory cannot exceed some threshold. In this figure, we show the percentage of automatically generated tests that violate a given maximum specification on the y-axis and the specified threshold on the x-axis. The results indicate, indicate that regardless of the specified maximum deviation, using a scoring model produces a, a larger percentage of tests that violate the specification. So for example, given a specified maximum deviation of four meters with no scoring model, only 30% of tests generated violate the constraints. However, our approach using a scoring model would generate tests uh, with approximately 70% of those tests violating the same specification. Developers can also use these tests uh, to investigate further the behaviors which lead to these violations. For example, using the ANAFI quadrata, we plotted the test that produced the largest maximum deviation. Here we show the expected trajectory as a black dotted line, the simulated position as the orange dashed line, and the real position as the solid green line. We found that when flying between waypoints two and three in simulation, Although it did not uh, follow the expected short line trajectory, it flew to a height of 29.9 .9 meters, which is inside the test world, which if you remember was 30 by 30 by 30 meters. In the real world, however, the drone flew to a height of 31.34 meters, which is 1.34 meters over the designated flying altitude of 30 meters. A pilot flying the quadrotor, who was not aware of the distinct behavior shown through this trajectory, would at best be surprised and at worst experience a collision. So in conclusion, we have introduced a novel approach for the automatic generation of feasible and stressful trajectory gen, uh, uh, trajectories for mobile robots. And the approach was able to generate physically feasible trajectories that caused a mean increase of stress of up to 76%. Thank you. And I will gladly answer any questions that you have. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so if you, ha you have any question, please leave it uh, in the Slack channel. So I will ask, uh, a question first. Sure. Uh, so, um, would you expect a, a difference in the stress scores uh, between the simulation and the physical or? That's a that's a really good question. Um, so, I guess that that all goes down to how robust your simulator is, um, and if you have a simulation that, let's say, exactly mimics the real world then I would expect that your stress 
in your simulation would um, match the stress in the real world. However, we found, and if I went back a couple of slides, let's see if I can quickly do that. Um, so there we go. In this, in this uh, slide over here, what we, you'll notice is that on the left, I've got the simulated results and on the right, I've got the real results. And these are the exact same trajectories um, using the, the ANAFI's uh, simulator and in the real world. And you'll see that in the real world, the stress actually gets slightly higher. And that's just because it's impossible to get the, the fidelity of certain simulators up to the point where it mimics real life. I mean, there could be wind, there could be any sort of factors, GPS noise um, that causes the robot to not be, to, to basically have more stress than um, just if it was in simulation. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have another question, uh, which is, uh, do you think the combination of uh, uh, actions would matter? Because now when you generate uh, trajectories, you consider uh, a pair of waypoints. Uh, do you think, uh, for example, the action can lead to some uh, consequences that will happen later? Sure. Um, so that's, that's a really good question. And I think if you were to, so, so the question being that when we consider the scoring function, we're only considering two waypoints. But what we actually are doing there is we are just estimating the, the amount of stress that we're going to see on these waypoints, uh, on the, these trajectories. And these trajectories actually are, you know, series of, of different uh, waypoints as we go. And the reason that we want to be using, you know, many waypoints is because the, in order to induce the stress on these robots, you want to kind of start off and uh, fly, you know, in a, in a drone, you would fly off in a certain direction. And over time, you would start to get worse and more and more and more stress and build it up. And so when we build these trajectories, we do want them to be a, a much longer, a much longer length initially. Um, I think if you were to just be thinking of two trajectories, like two waypoints specifically, what you would need to start to do is start to consider all the different um, initial conditions you could possibly have. And that becomes a very computationally expensive task. And so by building these longer trajectories, what we actually are doing is um, we're allowing this, basically the stress to accumulate and build up in the robot as it flies or drives, depending on what it needs. Okay, thank you. That's fair. Um, yeah, thank you again for the talk. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Thank you so much. Yeah, so the third talk will be uh, detecting cache related bugs in Spark application. And the talk will be given by Dong Wang from uh, Institute of Software Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, and also like to mention that uh, the authors have made their uh, artifacts uh, available and uh, it also earns the functional and reusable badges. Yeah, Dong, please. Huh? Uh, okay, thank you. I think I'm the last one. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dong Wang uh, from University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. Today I'm here to present our work about detecting catch-related bugs in Spark applications. Spark is one of the most popular big data processing systems and uh, widely used in many big internet companies for example, Facebook, Alibaba, and uh, eBay. There are also many popular applications built on Spark, such as GraphX, MLLab, and the Spark Circle. Spark utilizes the abstraction of resilient distributed dataset, RDD for short, to store and retrieve data. In this world count example, the program retrieves a text file from HDFS and for an RDD data. Transformation operations are used to generate new RDDs. Flat map in this, in this example is a transformation operation. It is used to split the text into words. When the program meets action operations, a job is generated and executed. Count in this example is an action operation. As its function name shows, it can count a number of words and return the value. This action generates job A2, A1. To save the precious memory, all RDDs are removed from memory after the action executes. When an action is used by another, when an RDD is used by another action, it will be computed again. In this example, there is another action take. 
tick is used to fetch out the first 10 words and generates the second job A2. A2 also uses RGG data and words so they are recomputed again. Spark provides catch APIs to persist an RGD in memory. We persist the RGD words before A1. After A1, words is still in memory. When the second action executes, A2 can directly use persisted words and avoid duplicated computation. If an RGD is used by multiple actions and not properly persisted, a missing persist bug occurs. Missing persist bugs can cause duplicated computation on RGDs, thus introduce large performance degradation. However, persist API cannot be used casually because persisted RDDs can usually occupy large memory. Thus, if an RDD is persisted but never used in following actions, an unnecessary persist bug occurs. Like this example, both data and words are persisted in A1, but the second job A2 directly uses words to execute. Data is persisted but not used, so caching data is unnecessary. Unnecessary persist bug can cause memory waste. Persisted RDDs should be released when no actions use it anymore. Spark provides API on persist to release persisted RDDs. In this example, persisted RDD is used by A2, but it is not used by the following actions such as A3 and A4. So it should be unpersisted before A3. If, a persisted, if the persisted words is not released, it is a missing unpersisted bug and cause memory waste. Misusing unpersisted operation at wrong positions can also introduce bugs. A persisted RDD should be released timely when, when not used anymore. For example, persisted words is not used by A2 so it should be unpersisted after A2. If a persisted RDD is unpersisted before the actions that will use it, a premerge unpersisted bug occur. We consider a premerge unpersisted bug example. RDD words is persisted in A1. So after A1, words is still in memory due to the persisted operation. However, an unpersisted un operation remove it from memory. Then when A2 executes, words and the data are recomputed again. So premature unpersisted can cause duplicated computation and introduce performance degradation. Similarly, persisting RDDs are at uh, wrong positions can also introduce bugs. To be stored in memory for the following reuse, an RDD must be persisted before the first action that uses it. For example, A1 is the first action that uses words, so words should be persisted before A1. If a should be persisted RDD is persisted after the first action that uses it, a lagging persist bug occurs. For example, if words is not persisted in A1, but persisted after A1, words is not stored in memory when persist operation is invoked. So when A2 executes, words and data are recomputed. Nagging persist bug can introduce duplicated computation. Unpersisted RDDs cannot be later either. We mentioned that if a persisted RDD is not used anymore, it should be released timely. So if a persisted RDD is not released timely, a nagging unpersisted bug occurs. For example, job A3 and A4 does not use RDD words. Words is still stored in memory when A3 and A4 executes. After A3 and A4 finish, words is unpersisted. Thus, the nagging unpersisted operation causes memory waste when executing A3 and A4. In summary, we observe six kinds of misuses of catch-related APIs in Spark. We call all of them as catch-related bugs. Among them, three kinds of bugs cause duplicated computation, and the, the other three cause memory waste. All of them introduce performance slowdown on Spark applications. 
So we present catch check to detect catch related bugs in Spark applications. First of all, we, read, we run Spark applications and get its execution traces. Then we extract original catch decisions from traces. On the other hand, we also use these traces to infer correct catch decisions by three steps. First, we identify RDDs that should be persisted. Second, we identify persistent locations of these RDDs. Third, we identify unpersistent locations of them. Then we get correct catch decisions of all RDDs in the application. Finally, we compare the original catch decisions and the inferred catch decisions. The inconsistency between them denotes catch-related bugs in the application. Then we use, a, we use an extended word count example to illustrate steps of catch check. First is to collect execution trees. An execution trace in, includes two parts. First, actions and RDD dependencies. Second, persist and unpersist operations. First of all, we record the count action on RDD words as well as RDD dependencies of words. Words is persisted before action counts. We also record it. Similarly, we record the second action and the RDD dependencies and another persist operation on RDD result before the second action. Then followed by the third action and the RDD dependencies. Before the third action, there is an unpersisted operation on RDD words. At last, there is another unpersisted on RDD result. We record it and get the whole execution trace finally. We will use it to identify RDDs that should be persisted. Before that, we need to merge all RDD dependencies into the whole lineage graph. If the same RDD transformation occurs in different RDD dependencies, we merge it. For example, RDD data is transformed to RDD words. This transformation occurs in A1 and A2, so we merge them so as to pairs to result transformation. Then we begin to identify should be persisted RDDs on the lineage graph. The idea is very simple. If an RDD is depended by multiple actions, that is to say it is computed in multiple jobs to avoid duplicate, duplicated computation, we should persist it. RDD words is depended by both A1 and A2, we persist it. Although RDD data is also dependent by A1 and A2, it cannot be reused by them when words is persisted. So, or, so data should not be persisted. In a similar way, RDD result is dependent by A2 and A3, so it should be persisted. RDD pairs should not be persisted since the result is persisted. Next, we infer the correct catch decisions for this should be persisted RDDs. First, we identify persisted locations for every RDD. The idea is that if uh, a should be persisted RDD is persisted right before the first, first action that you see it. For words, A1 first you see it. So it should be persisted before A1. For results, a2 first use it, so it should be persisted before A2. Then we identify unpersistent locations for should be persisted RDDs. The idea is that the persisted RDD should be unpersisted right after the last action to use it. For words, A1 uses it. A2 also uses it. A3 directly uses persisted results and not use words. Thus, a2 is the last action to use words. RDD words should be unpersisted right after A2. In a similar way, RDD result is reused by A2 and A3. It should be unpersisted right after A3. At this point, we successfully infer the correct catch decisions. Finally, we detect catch-related bugs by comparing catch decisions. There are catch decisions we inferred before. We compare them with the original 
cache decisions. If a cache decision exists in one sequence but not in the other, there is a bug. For example, the original cache decisions do not have a persist operation on RGD words, so it is a missing persist bug. On the other hand, if two kinds of cache decisions have a difference in the relative location of cache decisions and actions, there is also a bug. For example, in the inferred cache decisions, the persistent operation on words is ahead of the first action, but they reverse in actual cache decisions. RDD words is behind action count, so it denotes a nagging persistent bug. The other kinds of bugs can also be detected by simply comparing the existence and the locations of catch decisions. You can find all detection rules in our paper. We raise three research questions to evaluate catch related bugs and the catch check. First, can catch related bugs seriously affect the performance of Spark applications? Second, can catch check effectively detect a low catch check? Catch related bugs in Spark applications. Third, can catch check detect new catch related bugs in real world Spark applications? To answer the first two questions, we establish a loan bug benchmark. We totally collect 18 loan bugs, six are word count examples used for illustrating six bug patterns, 12 are real world bugs selected from Jira. We have we evaluate how these bugs affect the performance of applications by comparing the execution time of buggy code and the fixed code. The results show that these 18 bugs introduce a performance slowdown by 0.1% to 51.6%. Among them, eight bugs introduce more than 5% slowdown. Besides, we found that missing persist, nagging persist, and the un premature unpersist bugs, which can cause duplicated computation, usually introduce larger performance slowdown. In contrast, unnecessary persist, missing unpersist, and the nagging unpersist bugs usually introduce slighter performance slowdown because memory waste rarely affects the execution time of applications. However, Bugs that cause memory waste can also cause severe impact. For example, in the missing unpersist bug, RDD is iteratively persisted in a while loop and never released. So it cause out of memory finally. We use catch check to detect these 18 bugs and all of them are successfully detected. For new bug detection, we select, we select sex applications to detect catch-related bugs in them. Three are Spark official applications. They are well-maintained and widely used. The other three are third-party applications from GitHub. Finally, we successfully detect all six kinds of bugs. We detect 72 catch-related bugs in total and report all of them to the community. As a result, 53 bugs have been confirmed and the 28 have been fixed. In summary, we found six kinds of catch related bugs in Spark applications and the present catch check to detect them. The experiments show that catch related bugs can indeed cause performance slowdown for Spark applications. Also, catch check can effectively detect them both for known bugs and new bugs. Catch check is publicly available on GitHub. Anyone who is interested in it, please feel free to contact us. Uh, thanks for your attention. I'm ready for answer questions. Okay, uh, thank you Joel, for the great talk. So if uh, from the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the chat uh, in, in the Slack channel. So I'll start with uh, a question. So you've mentioned that you've defined uh, six bug patterns uh, do you think it, uh, this set is complete? Does it include uh, uh, all the uh, performance and memory related bugs? Uh, yes, uh, we, we think uh, that it is complete because we uh, summarize these six kinds of bug patterns by analyzing uh, the execution model and the programming model of Spark and uh, its cache, cache uh, mechanisms uh, and uh, 
try to find out uh, how uh, developers use them. Uh, so um, we think um, that, that is all about patterns that can uh, affect the performance of um, Spark ap applications. Uh, but there are also um, many other um, not bugs, um, just uh, misuse catch related, catch related APIs, uh, but then but they uh, will not affect the performance of Spark, Spark applications. Okay, thank you. And the next, uh, the next question is, um, do you think how easy or how difficult it is to generalize your method to other big data platforms? Mm, cache check is currently designed for Spark, so uh, it may be it may um, be able to generate generalize to other big data systems that have the same or similar catch mechanisms as Spark. Uh, for example, uh, in order to in reduce the cost of recomputation and the reloading fails, Hadoop and uh, Flink have have uh, optimized or planned to optimize similar catch rate me mechanisms. Uh, catch check, I think catch check can directly be adapted into these this system spots. Uh, if a big data system does not adapt the catch mechanism like Spark, so I think uh, we must do more work to perform the perform catch check on them. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I think we're running out of time. Uh, so thank you again for all the presenters for their uh, great talks. And also thank you everyone uh, for participating. So this will be the end of this session. Uh, I also believe this will be the end of today's talks. Uh, so we'll um, hopefully meet you tomorrow again.